Everyone knows what an office document is, and of the office suite, Word is likely the most prominent. But can office documents lead to ransomware? In this video, we'll explore how the prolific LockBit ransomware group goes from this rather suspicious looking Word document that could land in anyone's inbox, to this, a computer with all of its important files encrypted and a ransom note demanding you pay to recover. This can be a scary situation that users and organizations all over the world can face. In this video, we'll explore how malware authors abuse features of the Office suite to bypass security defenses, execute macro code using a technique known as template injection, and finally deliver the ransomware. Before we get started, please take a moment and hit that like and subscribe button. Comments are open as well, so let me know what you think of this video. Also, if you're new to analyzing malicious documents or just like having a handy reference available, I've created this free three-page quick reference guide just for you. This reference includes common file types, common commands to run, and other useful tips for analyzing a variety of malicious documents, such as Word, Excel, OneNote, and PDFs. I've got a link in the description, so grab your copy now. Let's get started with our analysis. One of the first things that I typically like to do is to see if the document contains macros, because macros are such a common way of executing code. For this document, I'm going to start with OLE dump. Running OLE dump with just the document as the argument will provide you with the really the table of contents, the different streams and folders within that document. Right now, OLE dump is telling us that there isn't anything to inspect. This is usually a sign that this document doesn't contain macros. We can also try OLE VBA, another very common tool for analyzing malicious documents, and it's going to give us very similar results. No VBA or XLM macros found. So where could the malicious content be? Well, one step would be to jump right into a sandbox, and that's definitely a common tool that I would utilize. But for this video, I want to focus on analyzing the document itself. So let's go back to the folder that contains my document. You'll see I have other content here, and I wanted to capture all of the different stages and artifacts relevant for the analysis in this video. So we got to kind of pretend that those aren't there for the moment. But we'll go back to the original document, and I'm just going to use Detected Easy to get some information about the file type. Here you can see that Detected Easy is saying that this is a Microsoft Office Word 16.0 document. This means that it's a newer style, the OpenOffice XML. You'll also notice the file type is telling you that it's a zip. For the OpenOffice XML documents, that is the ultimate storage container. Is this the zip file? This means that we can use 7-zip to explore the contents of this archive. So there's a number of different areas that we could explore here. First of all, if you click on the Word directory, this is one further indication that we're dealing with an Office Word document. Going into that folder, though, I'm, I want to look for a file called vbaproject.bin. It's not there. That's the file that would contain the VBA macros. Well, being familiar with template injection, there's one other location I might look, under rels and settings.xml. We can just right-click and edit this file. Now, this isn't the easiest way to view this information, so I'm going to copy and paste this into CyberChef and use the XML Beautify operation. Now we can see that not only is that XML well-structured, but we have some interesting information here. That is that we can see the URL to 825testsites.com slash fgi5k8.m. This is part of the attached template property. And this is one of the locations where you can find remote template injection. What this document is doing is that once it's open, the main document, the one we've been analyzing, doesn't contain any macro code. However, it contains a remote template. And that template is what contains the macro code. Now you can see in this resource that the file is named fgi5k8.m. That's the extension for a macro-enabled template. The resource requested here won't always be this obvious, but it's one further indication as to the next steps in our analysis. How do you get that file? Well, you have a couple of options. One is to just try to download that file using a utility yourself, such as curl or wget. That's typically what I do. That requires that your VM has connection to the internet, though, and that's not always an ideal case. You could also go and look for that primary document now on an online sandbox. There's a good chance it's already been uploaded publicly somewhere, and within that PCAP or the different artifacts that that sandbox provides, you'll find this document. In either case, I've already downloaded it and called this stage2.m. 
I like to use stage number and then an extension to help me organize the sequence in which I encounter these artifacts. Okay, now when we run Oli Dump on this document, you'll see that there is a stream at index 3 that contains macros. That's evident by the uppercase M. We can also use Oli VBA. With this output, we get a summary table that helps to highlight some suspicious or important indicators, such as the auto exec function. What, what function defined in the macro stream will automatically execute when we open this document? What other suspicious behaviors are there? There's a call to get object, which could then create an object to download content from the internet or to create an instance of a shell object to execute some command. There's also evidence of base64 strings. Now, just eyeballing this, you can see it looks like there's a curl command and maybe a PowerShell command. These macros are using a very common technique. That is to fill a string, such as a PowerShell command, with a bunch of junk characters. Those junk characters then are replaced using the replace command at runtime. So that way when we try to extract the string statically, it's full of these bad padded characters and will likely thwart our analysis attempts. At runtime, those are removed. So now there is a valid base64 string or, or a valid PowerShell command. You can see that with the last replace command. CMD indicates that it's going to execute something at the command line. And following that, we have POW, which I would suspect is PowerShell. Then there's a curl command and our URL. We can see it's obfuscated. But we also know the token that is used to obfuscate it. Replace command will take as a first argument the string, the second argument the pattern to replace, and the third argument, what to replace it by. That means that if we copy the string into a utility like CyberChef, we can replace those tokens with the correct value, lowercase e in this case, and get our cleaned up command. Now we can see that we have a PowerShell command and it's being used to execute curl to learn testsitescom slash b slash abc.exe. The dash o argument indicates where this file should be stored and the ampersand gar z indicates that there is concatenation here to this command with gar z being a variable. After that, the command will execute the downloaded payload. What is gar z though? If you go back to our macro code, you can see that the gar z variable is defined within two statements. The first is a variable that contains the beginning part of the path, c colon backslash users backslash pub. The next statement then concatenates itself, that string value, with the LIC, the remaining characters for public, and then CW3FD.exe. So now we know the location that it's going to not only be downloaded, but also executed from. Now, moving on to this final stage, we have what we would suspect is an executable file. I've just saved that as abc.bin. Let's use Detected Easy to just take a quick first look at this file. Okay, we can see that this is a PE file, so likely this was the final stage, the final payload that this sequence of events intended to execute. But what is it? Well, we could look for other characteristics, such as sections and entropy and strings, but you'll find that there's enough obfuscation here that we're not going to be able to see a whole lot about this file. Another step would be to run it in a sandbox. But if we're already in analysis VM, and do some dynamic analysis here. Now, normally when I get to this stage and I want to run an executable on my own analysis VM, I want to make sure that I have a number of tools running, such, a, such as Process Explorer, Process Monitor, maybe FakeNet to simulate or emulate network services, as well as to capture network traffic. But in this case, I already know the damage that's going to be done here. And the reason I would do that is because a lot of times malware isn't going to be obvious about what it's doing to the system. Of course, ransomware is a little different because ransomware is going to be very noisy and ultimately leave you with a ransom note. So we can run this executable and almost immediately begin to observe the results of its capabilities. And finally, we get to the point where the ransomware has completed its actions. It's ransomed all of the files that it's after on the system and left the ransom note. With this ransomware, you'll see it not only changes your desktop, but it also leaves ransom notes throughout the different directories that it's affected. This follows in the convention of a apparently random sequence of characters followed by .readme.txt. The victim will be able to open that file and follow instructions on how to pay them the ransom. Now, the focus of this video was just on how does the malicious office document lead to ransomware. 
If you're interested in seeing more ransomware analysis, please let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, that's it for this video. We've gone from a seemingly benign office document to ransomware in just a few simple steps. We've also discussed some of the important host-based indicators, the locations where the ransomware is dropped, as well as network-based indicators, the locations where the macro-enabled template, as well as the ransomware itself, get downloaded from. If you like this video, don't forget to hit subscribe and like, and I hope to see you in the next video. Until then, I hope everyone keeps exploring.